Hi, I'm Tintin Wisniewski from the Hoover Institution. Hoover's Corette Task Force on K-12 Education, with the help of some friends, has attempted to project what American education might look like in the year 2030. By that time, today's newborn will become college freshmen. The task of looking so far ahead while fre refreshing is also quite formidable. We invite you to join us in this predictive video presentation in search for solutions to the challenges that American education faces in the years ahead. For more information about this project, please visit our website at AmericanEducation2030.com. Dan Willingham is professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. He is interested in all areas of cognition and especially in the application of cognitive principles of K-12 education. He shows how some of the heavy burdens now placed on teachers will be easy by 2030, freeing them to become far more effective and focused in the classroom. As you might have heard, the scores for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also called the Nation's Report Card, for the year 2030 have just been released, and they continue the trend we've seen over the last 10 years substantial improvement across subjects and across grades. My purpose here today is to try to explain what's caused this phenomenal increase, and I'm going to argue that the main cause of the change lies in the mind of the teacher. Namely, up until about the year 2010, teachers were asked to do three tasks that were unreasonably difficult. Nobody could do them. So I call these tasks mental obstacles. The first mental obstacle for teacher was developing a curriculum on their own. Selecting the most important concepts in a field and putting them in an order that will make sense to students requires very deep knowledge of a discipline. Most people with a doctorate don't have that kind of broad and comprehensive knowledge of a field, and neither do most teachers or administrators. The second mental obstacle was the writing of lesson plans. Back in 2010, first-year teachers didn't graduate from schools of education armed with ready-to-go lesson plans. At that time, about 80% of teachers reported writing more than 90% of their lesson plans. Now imagine being a first-year teacher and being responsible for writing 180 days worth of lesson plans, six hours to fill for each day. And you've got to write those lesson plans under tremendous time pressure. It's impossible to do a good job under those circumstances. The third mental obstacle was the demand that teachers cope with chronically disruptive students. Teachers often reported that two or three students in their class might soak up 75% of their attention. The other kids in the class were obviously shortchanged. These students were often either far behind the rest of the class or far ahead. They were bored, and so they acted out. Teachers didn't have any good options in helping these students. OK, so what's changed in the last 20 years? The starting point was the creation of a set of national standards in 2010. The standards aren't a curriculum. They describe what students should learn during each grade, but they don't specify the materials that should be used and how they should be sequenced. Crucially, most people thought that the national standards really were better than almost any of the state standards that were in place at the time, so these new national standards were widely accepted. Once most states were on board with the standards, it seemed only natural that there should be a national test that accompanied the standards so that one could assess whether states and districts and individual schools were meeting the standards. Administrators were eager for their students to score well on the test, and that made them more open to adopting a set curriculum that was closely aligned to the standards. Some states developed a curriculum and mandated that all the schools use it. Other states had a short menu of approved curricula that schools could choose from, some generated by textbook publishing companies, some created by teachers. Other states just let districts do whatever they wanted, but once it became plain that a set curriculum closely linked to the national standards helped students do well on the national test, most districts were eager to adopt a curriculum. So that's how the first mental obstacle, writing a curriculum, was removed. Once the set curriculum was in place, teachers across the state, or even across the nation, might be teaching the same material, and they knew that. So trading lesson plans became logical. By 2015, there were several nonprofit portals on the internet where teachers could upload and download lesson plans. These were local affairs, sometimes sponsored by a district. More often, it was just a single teacher who was interested in technology who got it going. The positive side to classroom-ready lesson plans was obvious. Beginning teachers no longer had to write 180 days' worth of plans from scratch. And even expert teachers could benefit from other teachers' experience. But teachers also perceived disadvantages to all this. Having a set curriculum and an increasing reliance, even if it was voluntary, on packaged lesson plans seemed to threaten teacher autonomy. The teachers' unions successfully argued that because the curriculum and lesson plans were virtually mandated, Teachers had less flexibility, 
and that made classroom management more difficult. Something had to be done about chronically disruptive students. Union officials suggested that these students be taught in separate classrooms with very low student-teacher ratios. Students were able to work at their own pace, which was crucial because most of the disruptive students were either far ahead or far behind the rest of the class. A new specialty within the teaching profession emerged to teach in these classrooms. These teachers concentrated on methods of motivating students and keeping them on task. In these special classrooms, teachers could get to know each student quite well because of the small class size and because students remained in the same classroom throughout the day. This program was first adopted in New York State in 2022 and it was an enormous success and was rapidly imitated in other states. Students who were separated into these classrooms learned much more than they had in their other classes. The teachers of regular classes reported that the classroom atmosphere improved with the disruptive students removed. So that's the story. In the last 20 years, three mental obstacles to the teaching profession have been removed. The writing of a curriculum, writing all the lesson plans on your own, and the attention drain of students who are chronically disruptive. I've described these changes as the removal of mental obstacles for the teacher, but what was really important were the consequences for students. Classrooms that were less chaotic, instruction that followed a sensible, structured sequence, and teaching methods that were known to be effective.